I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we shall carry nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. Our Savior Christ, Jesus, abolished that and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of hell. Because I live, you will live also. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things are passed away. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I want to greet you today. It is my pleasure to welcome you into this sanctuary. It is a good thing that you are doing to come and worship with us as we celebrate the life of Linville Foskin. Not only are you here to pay your last respects, you are here to honor the surviving members of the family, and we appreciate that very much. Our opening hymn for today is How Great Thou Art. After the hymn is sung, the assistant pastor, Reverend Lawrence Blackett, will give the opening prayer, and I'll turn the service over to him for his coordination. How great the work. Then 
sings my soul, my Savior God to be. How great thou art, how great thou art. When I feel that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died. Take away my sin. Sings my soul. How sweet not to be. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sing. Sings my soul, my Savior God to be. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to be. How great thou art, how great thou art. Let us all pray. Almighty and eternal God, by whom the Holy Spirit ministered to us in our weakness, and in the victory of your Son, Jesus Christ, he gives us a pledge of eternal life. Lift us, we pray, above this present distress and sorrow, and shed light, and, and give us the grace and glory to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We are met in this solemn moment to consecrate the, our brother, Limwell Augustine Foskin, who, sent, who God has sent him to us to be one of his beloved brother. Remember, O oh God, as we celebrate the life of our brother, we come knowing that he is gone to meet our Savior. So as we celebrate the life, we will celebrate it with family and friends as we give God praise. Please be seated.
first scripture reading for this morning is John 14, verses 1 to 6 in the New King, the New King James Version. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Please stand for the, for the scripture reading. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father, in my Father's house as are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and, and you may, and way, excuse me, <laughs> and way you go no, the way go no. <laughs> Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how we can know the way. Jesus said to him, I am the way of truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here endeth the reading. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. It seems strange to say it is a pleasure to be here at the celebration of Lynn Vow's homegoing. However, I know that you realize that all of us, I am sure, would have heavy hearts because if you are close to Lynn Vow as family, as friend, you know that you have lost somebody deeply and Obviously, there will be a hole in your heart because one has gone on to meet his maker. I had the pleasure of being introduced to Brother Foreskin a long while ago, around 2003, when we met him at East York Scarborough BME Church, the church he loved. And my husband was there as the assistant pastor at the time, alongside the late Reverend Livingston Yearwood. As we got to know him, we had the smiles and the chuckles back and forth. And I'm speaking about myself. I always used to tease him because here was a gentleman always put together. And I'd always point out something that he was wearing. And I then said to him, you remind me so much of my father because that is the way in which he, he handled, he represented himself. Who would know a few months ago that Linville would be on his journey to be with his heavenly father? And we had the opportunity to be with him at the hospital for a few times and also at the home. And this came to my mind because whenever I would see him here at Christ Church, at East York, wherever, if I didn't get to lock eyes with him and get to say hi to him, he would always wait and he'd be looking to be sure that we connected. He was a Libran, like myself, and we always used to say to each other, we're very balanced people. A friend has gone on, and as we visited, 
there were times when just he and I, and I would be holding his hand, and I would be speaking to him although he could not respond in hopes he could hear. And then at the very end, singing to him, because he always made a comment any time. So to Sister Charmaine, thank you for the honor of coming today. And now he is dwelling in the house of the Lord forever, because God has led him, taken his hand, and led him home. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand, I am tired, I am weak, I am worn, through the storm, through Precious Lord, lead me home when my way grows drear. Precious Lord, linger near when my life is almost gone hear my cry hear my call hold my hand lest I fall take my hand precious Lord lead me appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone at the river I stand guide my feet hold my hand take my hand precious Lord lead me home precious Lord take my hand lead me on let me stand i am tired i am weak i am worn through the storm Lord, lead me home. Take my hand. 
precious Lord, lead me been asked to give a tribute <clears throat> that before I do that I would like to offer my deepest sympathy and condolences to Sister Charmaine and the Foreskin family. You know it's been a great loss. It's a void that will not be easily filled at all. I first got to know the Lenville and the Forskim family many, many years ago. I was sharing with Laurentin. And of course, no place but 460 Shore Street. At that time, Lenville would come to church, but he was sort of low key at the time. He would smile, but he never got involved. But then, East Short Scarber then came in. Then he joined, the family joined East Short Scarber. And it was, ran into him many times, and he always had this saying, he would say, uh -huh, just like that. You know, not too much, but uh -huh. But it was at East Short that then, Lenville began to really expand. He got, became a member, got baptized, and then be, be shown behold it, he got involved not only with the men's fellowship, but with every area of the church. I've known him all the years I've known him. He was very quiet, very easygoing. But he always is always sure about what he wants and what he's going to do. I was fortunate, as First Lady says, that I was able to visit him in his last days at Scarborough General. I was supposed to meet with uh, Dr. Searles uh, for a meeting. He called me and says, "Meet me at Scarborough General," and I got there and then. Some of his short folks were there, and also the senior pastor was there. And we spent some time with Lenville, and we prayed for him. It was during that time that I realized that he was traveling. But one thing I know for sure, he's gone home to be with the Lord. He had accepted Jesus Christ as a Savior. He was living that life. And today I know that he's with the Lord. I believe up there he's saying the same thing. Uh -huh. If his family. But may God bless you, the family, as you remain and you may you stick together, close together. This is the time that you need to be close to each other, supporting one another for the days, months, and the years ahead. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Good afternoon. Upon reflection of one life journey after they are past, 
Each person will always have a particular moment of remembrance. I met Brother Forskin at the East South Scarborough BME Church when he became a member in 1992. Shortly afterward, he became a member of the Men's Fellowship Group which was initiated by the minister in charge at that time, who was the right Reverend Maurice X. As president of that organization, I got to know the person. He was a dedicated supporter of the church and the men's fellowship group. He loves to sing, and over the years, his prayer life had improved rapidly, and he become a prayer warrior for the group. To quote a scripture by which he live would be James 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? Let him sing. His passion for the church was commendable. Even on his sickbed, he was soliciting funds for the building at 1567 Kingston Road. He served as an usher for many years. He was instrumental as one of the trustees in acquiring the building he will be surely missed. Remembering is to thank God for the time we share with him. To the families and friends, our deepest condolences. And on behalf of the ministers, officers, and members of East York Scarborough BME Church, we thank you for sharing such a faithful dedicated and selfless person with us. He's gone from us, but he is present with the Lord, safely in his arms. Thanks for your patience. Good morning, everyone. I must first say this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This morning, I am asked to give condolence, a tribute. What can I say about my brother that many of you doesn't know? What I'm going to say is for those who do not know. Brother Forskin, praise be to God, is a brother of the Lord. He is called as a servant of the Most High God. This morning, on behalf of the Missionary Society, hallelujah. We would like to give our condolence to the family of the foreskin. This morning, my recall about Brother Foreskin that he have a meek spirit. Brother Foreskin 
At all times I used to bother him. And uh, what I used to bother him about. I love my food. And I used to tell him that, oh, Brother Forskin, you have to cook for me. And he said, I cannot cook. <laughs> but anyway, I love my cornmeal and my sidnapper steam fish. And Brother Forskin always says, you know, I can cook. So I says to him, okay, if I die before you, and you come and look at me, I'm going to blow at you. <laughs> and Brother Foreskin says to me, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you the money. And you go and buy your cornmeal and your sinapa fish. At all times, Sister Mac and Sister Foreskin used to be there, and Sister Foreskin always said, I don't business with you all. I come here and see you, no? <laughs> he gave me the money. I have my delicious cornmeal and my delicious steam fish, and I never bother him again. <laughs> so this morning, Sister Foreskin, he's not here, so you have to take up the task <laughs> because you are a good cook. Anyway, Brother Forskin joined the Missionary Society and he was the president, vice president of the missionary and he was the one little man among so many ladies. But his personality and everything blending as a man of God. And today I can stand and say he is missed and we love him. And I don't know who God is going to send among we missionary ladies, but we are prayer warriors and we are going to ask God to send us another giant. What Brother Foreskin did for us over the years, every trip, every dinner, every luncheon, every prior breakfast, he always dear. He is a man with a heart of gold. He never late. And when it come to contribute to the work of God, he wasn't mean. Sometimes in our uh, missionary meeting, and when time for the collection, Brother Forskin always say, how much I owe? How much dues I owe? And sometimes he owes nothing. But Brother Forskin always loved to give, and he always give above. So this morning I want to say, to the family, the torch that he has left in this world, take it up and run with it for the Lord. The beauty about it when we have dinner or any function, these children never absent. He always invited them to our function. And I give God thanks and praise for the life that he lives as a godly man. And today, Brother Foreskin, maybe you can't hear me, but I know that you are in heaven. And I know that some of my church family are there already. So I pray that when you see them, you will have a wonderful time with them. And I do not know how long I will be here on earth, but I want to know that when the Lord take me, I will be there, and we all will have a hallelujah time. Again, you are missed by your lovely smile. You are missed by the priors, and you are missed, hallelujah. When you are called upon, you never say no. I pray that the family will draw strength from the life which he lived here on earth. 
And for us, as God's children, I pray we will continue loving the life that he lives and that we will continue to live the life that God called all of us to live that one day when God son return and that roll call we all will be there the bus trip he is going to be missed and everything because he's a worker I don't know but he always do the best by gathering the funds for the work of God. So as missionary this morning, the work has to go on, and he is not here, but we trust that the Lord will send us someone again to continue this wonderful work. And to my pastors, I pray God blessings upon each and every one. Holy fault. Jesus is coming again. And we are all working for this celestial city. Let us rejoice and be glad. Because he is coming again. And this morning is not a time to mourn. It is a time to rejoice because of the life that he has lived. And because we have lived in this life. Let us rejoice and be glad. God bless you.
Good morning to each and every one. I am happy to be able to be here to say, pay it a small tribute to Linville Foreskin. Going back to the early days, like uh, Reverend Hicks had said, back to 460 Shaw Street, we knew that he was there and he brought his children there and my children were there and they grew up together in the Sunday school there. I was all impre always impressed with the fact that he decided to make sure that his children came to Sunday school and that they grew up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I always felt that he, from an early age, must have known the Lord and that he had an upbringing that, that taught him that he should love the Lord and as he grew through childhood, through manhood, and through fatherhood, that he would bring his children up also in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Do I believe that he was not just the one who will attend church and that's it? Do I believe that he was saved? I believe so most sincerely. How do you know when a person is saved? The Bible says, by their fruit, he shall know them. And I admired him as being a person who loved the Lord and who decided that he would bring his children up in the same vein and fashion to love the Lord. I mentioned the word saved. I believe he was saved. I don't know what age, what time he was saved, but I believe it was from his youth. And he made sure that his children did the same thing, became saved and trained in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As I was thinking of the things that I would say, Regarding him, the word salvation came to me, and I use the word saved because I believe as a Christian he was saved. And then I thought I could use a couple more S's if I can regarding him in making this presentation, making paying him this tribute. And I thought of when I was at school, the teachers used to say, you have to learn the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. And everyone was expected to do that. So I felt, well, I, I just thought of something that uh, Reverend Searles sometimes uses the term three P's, three P's. And he will tell you about three P's sometime when he has a, a, a little time to joke with you. But I thought I would use three S's. Sometimes I think of three R's, and sometimes I think of three S's. So the first S, in Lindell's life was his salvation. I thought of him as being a saved person. Why is he saved? The, the word says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. 
and he is a believer. He was a believer, and I believe he was saved. Now, the other S that I was thinking about is the, the S that goes with sanctification. Sanctification. And I've always thought of sanctification, and I, I read it to him, because sanctification is as, as though you are on a journey, on a journey, and he was on the journey. And he thought of salvation, when he mentioned salvation, as the train tracks along which the train of The, along which the train of sanctification travels. So he was on that train of sanctification, and I think we could see it in his actions. We could see it in the things that he did. He was on that train, and that train was carrying him on to glorification. And now he's glorified. So I say, as I pass my condolences on to the family, the sister Charmaine and the children, that he is now safe in the arms of Jesus because he was on that train of sanctification, traveling, traveling, traveling. And he's traveled home, and he is now being glorified. He's glorified, so I have no fear that he is in the arms of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He showed that in his life. I thought of some of the things that I would say about him, most, uh, some have already been said. I looked at him as being a gentleman. Gentleman, not only a gentleman put together like that, but as a gentle man. And that's how I always looked at him. And I always thought of him as being a helpful and generous person, helpful because he's always willing to assist in whatever way he could. He was always willing to do that. And he also did so much in the church that I move now to the the last S, service. He always wanted to be of service in the church. When I went to East York Church in 2007, I found Brother Forskin on the trusty board. And he has remained on that board all through the years until now the time of his passing. And that's a busy board because you have to be engaged in things that go on right across. Not only on the trustee board, but I found that he, being in, on the trustee board, would be part of the official board and the quarterly official board. And uh, as has been mentioned, he also got involved in the men's fellowship. He also got involved, as being mentioned, in the missionary. He was always being an active person in the church, living a life before each and every one of us that were there, and with whomever he came into contact, he was an example, an example. 
And I, I, I love, I think, uh, prayer was mentioned. The way when he's called upon to pray, that he would always give an excellent prayer as he uh, was brought up again, I go back to his upbringing. And although I don't know it, I could see it because I could see what was happening with him in his life. And he would always be very efficient in asking God to help others around. And he himself was always willing to help. I remember with, when the Sunday school was putting on programs, if they wanted some extra funds to help buy gifts and things like that, Brother Forskin was one of them that will be always giving into that to help some extra gifts to give to the Sunday school children. He was always, always being very, very helpful. And he did not uh, fear to get involved in the things that, like in the finances, to look after the building when things had to be done around the building. He would always be one of those people that would be willing to go and lend a hand and spearhead the things that were there. I always admired that about him. And the one thing that I know, and I said about him, that he was very, very helpful. Helpful to all that needed a help around. He was always very, very helpful. And the other thing that stood out to me with him, and I uh, admire him for that, is his quiet attitude, his humility. His humility was something that I admired very much about him. And to the family, he has gone on to be with the Lord. Sister Charmaine and uh, Lorrington and Winslow and uh, Nadine, you all have a good example before you as a father because of his fatherhood. And I am sure that he is willing to see each and every one of you again as he is now, as I said before, resting in the arms of Jesus. And he wants to see every one of you, and not only you as his children, but every one of us who are here today who knew him so well. He was an example to a lot of us, a lot of people. And we will continue to miss him day in and day out. And we just hope that someone else could step in to do the job that he was doing, to be an all-rounder, more or less, to help and assist in every way. I thank God that he gave me the privilege of knowing him and to be able to work with him and to be on boards with him and to see how useful he has been. So continue to keep the family in prayer, as see, I say to the congregation here, as we will continue to keep them in our prayers, lift them up before the Lord, because he has promised to you, the family, Sister Charmaine and the members of the family, that he, God, will never leave you or he will never forsake you. And he will walk with you all through this life because that's a promise from him and a promise that he himself will keep. And you must keep on keeping on, holding on to God's unchanging hand all the days of your life. May he rest in peace. Amen. Amen.
tribute to my dearest grand uncle. For some of us, it's dad, grandpa, uncle Linval, brother Foskin, Mr. Foskin. For me, it's just uncle. I remember when I was living with him, as big as I was, anytime I get sick or just say I'm not feeling well, you would just see him get up if he's sitting, and return with a bottle of eucalyptus oil for me to inhale, and following was always a shot of brandy. <laughs> According to him, it's good, for it's good for inflammation, and it clears the mucus. Well, he was right. He was such a wise man, a hard nut to crack sometimes. When it comes on to showing his emotions, he wasn't big on wearing his on his sleeve. One day, I was at work and I called him, which was a regular thing for me. But that day we were talking and I sensed he was concerned about me. So I said to him, Uncle, I don't want you giving me any roses when I'm gone. I want my roses now. So I'm not getting off this phone until you tell me you love me. He just started to laugh. Then he said, I love you. After that day, oh man, it was the easiest thing for him to say to me. He used to enjoy getting into his car and drove to see the Brim Mall. And days when I'm available, we would sit in that mall and talk for two to three hours easy. When I move out, we kept our friendship just the same. He would call me at any time or text me. And if there is an event, whether a church or family event, he was sure to remind me to be there. I would normally stop by the house to hang out with him. So one day, I decided, to ring, to, I decided not to ring the doorbell or not the door. I sat on the porch instead and I called his cell phone. When he answered, I knew he was still in bed. So I was telling him how the weather is supposed to be nice today and he should get up out of bed and get some fresh air. His response was, I don't think so. I am watching the social. For, th for those of you who don't know, it's a Canadian, <laughs> Canadian talk show. I responded and said, I am outside. He was like, no, you're not. So I said, uncle, I am serious. I am outside. Please come and let me in. He opened the door. He opened, actually, he opened the screen door and pushed it. And then he looked out with his little head peeping at me. And then when I turned around and looked at him, that big smile, it was just so contagious. Fast forward to March 1st, 2024, when he went in the hospital, I made it my duty to be there as often as I could. I, one day I walked in, he lifted his hand and said, no sad face, only happy face. Another time I was there with him, I said to him, remember when I told you, don't give me any roses when I'm gone? He said, yes. I hold his hand and said, well, I won't be giving you any roses when you're gone. That is why I'm always visiting. I always hang out, always spending time with you because I'm giving you your roses while you're still here. You see, we did not come here to stay. We're just here for a little time. Back to the dust, we will go. Death, where is your sting? Because you have no hold on him. Lord, 
we know he's yours and so we thank you for sharing him with us we thank you for 84 years the special moments we shall cherish the beginning of life is always full of joy and the end is nothing less than sadness but it's the in-between that we should appreciate most his work on this earth has been completed he was a faithful man of God he was a family man a father a grandfather a husband twice a uncle a brother and a friend a peacemaker in every way always seemed to find the best in people and the best in any bad situation oh what a genuine soul he was he lived a full and long life I like to say after your three scores and ten you are now on borrowed time well his has now come to an end and his time on earth is over his reward go with him there's nothing else he can add and nothing else can be taken away from him his chapter is close until the trumpet is sound Jesus said peace I leave with you my peace I give unto you not as the world give it give I unto you let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid until we meet again my uncle rest Our second scripture reading is taken from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 58, reading from the New King James Version. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not fall asleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Thank you. This is the end of the reading. Right, Reverend Dr. Chester Sewells, I'm the senior pastor of this church and the presiding bishop of the conference. Well, we're here together. One of our stalwarts have gone home. One of our stalwarts have gone home. Linville Foskin, our brother and our friend. To me, 
he was also my neighbor. Given his demeanor, it is, norm, it is normal in times like these for us to have questions, but always remember, my brothers and sisters. At this time, we'd have many questions, but always remember that in this Bible, you'll find the answers. I wish that everybody would continue to read their Bibles and do it more frequently, not leaving it on the shelf to gather dust. But while I think of Brother Linville, I have to remember and recognize, according to the Bible, God had his plan for Linville's life, and a plan for him to prosper, which we all would agree he did. No one can change that. When God called him home, he called him home. In my last visit with him in Scarborough General Hospital, Janice and I witnessed his expression of love, compassion, and gratitude. Just to looking at him, you'd realize that he loved his family very much. As we looked at him, and he was enabled at that time to communicate with his granddaughter, Janelle, and her fiance, Joey, I know that, and I believe, just looking at him, if he had the strength at that time, he'd have jumped out that bed and just hugged them. How pleased he was and happy to be with them. And then later on, I understand his other grandchild, Serena, she came and visited with him. What a connection. The children down to the grandchildren. And now just seeing each and every one of you here today, it's a testimony of the life Linville lived. Linville, as I know him, he was always kind and loving towards everyone, no matter and regardless of who they were. My brothers and sisters, God writes his history through us. He writes his history through us. As I looked over at Linville, lying in the bed, yes, he was sick, but yet he glowed. He had that look on his expression on his face as if he had, was at peace with himself. And one thing came to mind. I was going to ask the doctor to check his vital signs to see what his pressure was. I don't think Linville could, was ever suffering from high blood pressure because he was always so calm and well composed. He couldn't have no blood pressure. If he did, there's something we had to fix that was not right. Now, I must understand also in reflection, I would say that there are three things I can highlight today. His love, his compassion, and his courage. Love. 
he was he always saw the good in others and regardless of how they may have treated him he never and he did not hold a large grudge you always hear him speak positively about individuals but remember Linval was no no pushover <laughs> he would let you know how he felt but don't worry the relationship stayed intact he may be upset with you about something but Linval is not one who have time to hold grudges compassion don't ever get sick or in need of something any type of support as long as Linval knew he be there to assist you and if he cannot do something physically i noted one thing that although he was not a a member of the clergy but he was engaged in a ministry of presence even in his illness he showed great concern for others who were in difficulty it was inspiring just looking at him care for his granddaughter denia at the home because i go there many times and would sit with him and we would talk and participate in his favorite pastimes you know one thing though he had courage his favorite words there is always a way to make life better he always regardless of how sad and how unpleasant the situation is he would always rise up and say listen there's a way out of this life could be better and for that i really thanked him because he was an inspiration and remember if we could hold on to this we all would be better people life challenges never got him down he always had hope always believe that tomorrow would be a better day my last visit with him at his home although he couldn't speak whenever he could muster up the strength to open his eyes and see me you could see the joyfulness in his heart which reminded me of the many days we sat and enjoyed looking at his favorite shows i must say i never know him playing sports i never know him walking or what exercises he took he did but the one thing i know he was really a passionate um lover of all sports he was one of like they could call a fanatic in the way he loved his sport and you're sure that somewhere along the line at least he played one of them now he would look at baseball he would look at hockey and if you're looking with him when he's looking at baseball and hockey you can have a chance to discuss something else and just talk along but i warn you when he was looking at wrestling the whole place kept quiet as the bunks around in the ring and as i was telling his family earlier as the bunks around in the ring he bunks around in the couch yes by the time the sport was over he was as tired as the one who actually played 
My brothers and sisters, his legacy will live on in our hearts. We'd always remember that guy. People may think he was short, but he's a very, very tall man in his heart. And we respected him for that. We loved him for that. Because being a peacemaker, no matter what the crowd looked like, he always found the middle ground so that we could get along. And that's one of his greatest strengths. To his immediate family, extended family and friends, especially Sister Sherman and all his children. Keep the faith and just always remember the God who washed away your sins will also wipe away your tears. God bless you all. If I tell you this isn't tough, I'm lying to you. Because he has left a hole. And that hole must be filled. Fill it with God. God, if you lean on him, he will take you through. And that's a guarantee because he told us clearly that he will be with us until the end of time. God bless you all. And now, on behalf of the British Methodist Episcopal Church Conference and all the churches, I will offer you, his family, our deepest condolences. This is the first time I'm saying it in public, but our hearts and thoughts and prayers are with you. Keep the faith, keep that chin up. Linval showed you a way of living. He did it. You can too. God bless you all. Blessings, guys. Blessings to everyone who came. <clears throat> uh, Lynn Bell Foskin. I call him Brother Foskin. That was my nickname for him. He used to scream it all, the, all throughout the house. Brother Foskin! <laughs> scream it. Um, he was a father to me. Um, I honestly don't know where I would be without him. <laughs> I don't know where I would be without him today. Um, his advice, his guidance that you've provided me has and will always stick with me forever. The advice that you give wasn't just to me, it was to my brothers, it's to my friends. My friends, when they had no place to sleep, no place to go, his door was always open. He never closed it to these guys. He accepted me and all of us here into his house. <clears throat> I just want to thank you for loving me as your own child. Thank you for loving my brothers the same and my sister. Thank you for supporting my mom in everything that she wanted to do. And the biggest thank you I can give is thank you for loving her. Thank you for loving her. And thank you again. Um, I'm Chris. I'm 
the brother of Greg, um, son of Charmaine. Um, a lot of people don't really know. I'm 36 now. I actually met Brother Foskin when I was about six, seven years old. For the people who know my grandma, my great grandma Winifred Dias, she was a member of the church. At that young age, I would just go stay with my grandma just for fun, you know? And it was on Sunday, him and his wife would pick us up for church. So it's going on 30 years. Brother Foskin has been in my life. He, at the point in time that he came, our family, literally all of us, were going through something that a lot of people don't know. Like my brother said, he gave us a home. He's been a stepping stone for me in the sense of what a man is, in the sense of a man who knows how to take care of his family. I never had that vision until I met him. The closest thing I had to a father was my big bro. I can give a million stories, literally, of the role that he's played in my life. My kids have a grandfather. I have a father who's consistent. Yes, I have a biological father, yeah, but I have a father who is consistent. <laughs> Thanks to Brother Foskey. I'm gonna miss him. I love him. I love him. Like my own. Like my bro was saying, my friends, when they heard the noise, the, the news, a lot of people broke down friends who we have. We were actually going through something with my own friends. I haven't spoken to some of my friends in years. But his passing brought them all to the house. They used to call him like the Uncle Phil. <laughs> That's how my friends look at him, Uncle Phil of the hood, you know? Or just the way he was just so accepting to everybody. How I am now, the vision that I have of being a man and the vision that I have of being a provider, it's thanks to him. Thank you for everything. Winslow, Nadine, and Laurenton. This could have went so much ways in other people's families. But you all accepted us. When I see you guys, when I talk about you guys, I don't tell them you guys are his kids. I tell them you're my brothers. I tell them you're my sister. I make sure Jenea, my son, call him grandpa, call you guys auntie and uncle, cause he didn't make me feel like I was ever something other than his son. So um, I just wanna let everybody know he, he is the epitome of what I know what a man should be. I've never had that vision growing up until he came. I know what I gotta do for my kids. I know how I want to provide for them. I know the structure of how I want to have a family because of him. So, Linval, Dad, I love you and thank you. Good morning, everyone. I was not gonna speak today. I'm not good at these things.
but I'm just gonna say I want to thank him for loving my mother loving us loving my niece and my nephew the way that he did he always supported my mother in everything that she did whatever journey she wanted to go on he was always there to support her follow her along some people call him her handbag <laughs> because wherever she was he was not far behind so I just want to say thank you to him it's been hard these last couple of weeks and we still have a journey ahead of us in the next week but we're all together and we're all supporting each other so thank you Good morning, everybody. Today I'll be reading a poem called God's Garden. God looked around his garden and found an empty place. Then he looked down upon the earth and he saw your tired face. He put his arms around you and lifted you to rest. God's garden must be beautiful because he always takes the best. He knew that you were suffering. He knew that you were in pain. He knew that you would never get well on earth again. He saw the road was getting rough and the hills were hard to climb. He closed your heavy eyelids and whispered, peace be thine. It broke our hearts to lose you, but you didn't go alone. For a part of us went with you the day God called you home. I may need this, so I'll take it out now. Okay, good morning to you all, attending pastors at the BME Church, Reverend Searles, Hicks, Martin and Blackett, Licorice, and Reverend Mercury. Mrs. Searles, Mrs. Six, uh, Deaconess Bennett, and Brother, and Mrs. Small for their contributions to this ceremony. I'd like to thank all the family and friends that uh, visited my dad at his home and at the hospital, and those that sent their prayers, well wishes over the last roughly two months. I'm sure it was a comfort to him, well I know it was a comfort to him, and very much appreciated by us. Thanks also to, also to those that attended the gathering at the BME Stark building last Friday. We weren't really sure how things were going to transpire, but we sang some hymns, enjoyed some food and fellowship, which is what my dad would have wanted. We remembered him through the pictures and the recollections of his nature and his antics. Thanks again to the BME church leadership for supporting us with this celebration of life service and all the fellowship, friendship and support for both my mom and dad and Charmaine over the years. And I also want to say thank you to the Highland uh, Funeral Home for their gracious service and professionalism. <laughs> I'm honored to share my thoughts with you about my dad, but I need to thank my daughter Serena, who gave me her oral history report that she had submitted for one of her university classes. It was an interview with her grandfather talking about himself, which he didn't normally do. And I've included many of those details in my comments today. On behalf of our family, I'd like to thank you all again for being here today to celebrate the life of my dad, Linville Augustus Foskin. While he missed, while he will be missed, he will not be forgotten. His humble but determined spirit has already been passed down to his next generation, along with his hardworking and, as we've heard, generous nature. Dad was the third of nine children born to Algon 
Boskin and Inez Murray. On Sunday, October 8, 1939, he had two older sisters, Daphne and Yua, and his younger siblings, Sylvia, Silbert, Evadne, Beryl, Leon, and Sonia. He had three children with his first wife, Christine, Winslow, Nadine, and myself, and four stepchildren with his second wife, Charmaine, Joanne, Gregory, Christopher, and Vincent. He had two grandchildren, my daughters, Janelle and Serena, and his stepchildren, step-grandchildren, Janae and Rashawn. Given Dad's seven siblings and the extended family through marriage, he also had many nieces, nephews, and grandnieces and nephews, and a few great grandnieces and nephews, and one godson, Julian. <laughs> Dad was born in Jointwood, one of the districts in Eldersley. Actually, I didn't know that. I didn't know. I, we don't, Jointwood, St. Elizabeth. I didn't know the Eldersley part until looking it up. Um, in the parish of St. Elizabeth, the beautiful island country of Jamaica and the West Indies. As my f kids know, and my brother and sister, I'm a big fan of books written by Malcolm Gladwell. So it was nice to hear Malcolm in an interview say that his mother was from St. Elizabeth. And then I also learned that Colin Powell, former U.S. Secretary of State, was also from St. Elizabeth, or his family was from St. Elizabeth. And then there's the reggae singer protege. Okay, enough name dropping. Let's just say that a lot of good people have their heritage in St. Elizabeth. Not all are famous, and my dad Linville was one of them. When dad grew up, there was no industry in Jointwood. It was mostly a community of small farmers harvesting for themselves and what they could take to the market and sell to the larger nearby towns. Dad came proudly that he walked, he walked when he was seven months old. That was according to his mother. His mother had told him that. And he recited that over and over to the kids when he would tell stories. Dad attended school up until the fifth standard. His family was poor and couldn't afford for him to move out of public school and to the sixth standard or higher. His father, his father used to run a, or used to have, a, a cultivate some sugar cane. So dad helped with that. He also picked pimento, ginger root, did some small jobs here and there. There was coffee a tree in the backyard of their humble home, so he would help to pick, dry, and then sell the coffee to stores. I've also got an allergy. <laughs> and it, it, it seems to be acting up right about now. Um, it was hard work, but that at 16 years old wasn't one for laying around and there wasn't any social assistance. After some time, he was given a recommendation to work on a farm in Spanish Town. He traveled about 110 kilometers from Jointwood, but on arrival he was informed that the owner was only looking for younger workers. Not wanting to go back home, he stayed the night and then decided he was going to go to his sister, Eulis, who was uh, living in Kingston. Despite the unexpected visit, Gigi, which is his sister Eula's name, as we know every West Indian has a nickname, uh, welcomed her brother and later Gigi's boyfriend got my dad a job in a masonry factory where he was also working. They made tiles and decorative blocks. Dad was a quick learner, eventually moved to operating a machine that formed the construction blocks using molds of various sizes. It was still hard work, but as dad always said, you do what you have to do to support yourself. If you ever shook his hand, you know the evidence of that hard work is in his hand. They were calloused and strong. On the same street as the house he was now sharing with yeah, he was sharing with Gigi, there was a local bar. And Dad met a pretty girl that worked in the bar, which was owned by her aunt. Before long, they realized if they lived together, they could save some money. So they got their own little apartment. That pretty one was my mom, Christine. And the owner of the bar was my aunt, Carmen. After about two years of dad working in the towel factory and mom at the bar, mom was encouraged by her aunt Catherine, sister of Carmen, um, who was already living in Canada, to take advantage of the West Indian domestic scream, scheme and immigrate herself. After two years of my mom working as a domestic employee for rich families in Toronto, 
and applying for sponsorship of her own family, my dad, along with my brother, Winslow, and I flew to Canada to join my mom. That was April 26, 1968. 56 years ago next week. Our reunited family lived with my mom's Aunt Sissy and Uncle Ken, and Ken helped my dad find an employment in the automotive rebuilding subsidiary of Canadian Tire. Dad worked 22 years rebuilding alternators, water pumps, and making brake shoes until the plant closed and it moved south. I recall the story he told about being at work, and a man came around with some of the managers on tour of the plant and stopped by my dad's workstation and asked a few questions. One question was, what would he do if a piece of hardware got stuck in part in the part he was working on? Would he leave it there to keep pace with the production volume? Limbo's response was immediate and almost incredulous, and I apologize for the Jamaican accent. Nah, man, you can't leave it there. You have to get it out up somehow, or else it will come loose and later cause problems. Sorry, sir. That man was the president of the company. And for late years later, he made a plant of stopping by my dad's workstation to say hello whenever he visited the plant. The attention from the president used to annoy my dad's boss, but that didn't let that bother him. He just did his work to the best of his abilities. Dad rarely took a sick day and he was rarely late for work. One of the perks given to the Canadian Tire employees was a children's party, and he took us to that every year, and we always looked forward to that. And then there was the Christmas box. <laughs> it came with candies, uh, filled with candies, cookies, tins of chocolates, canned meats. That was always a good night. As a family, we also spent holidays with the rest of the extended family. We had a circle with my aunts that held Christmas and Thanksgivings, and there were trips to Center Island, Niagara Falls, Marine Land, bus trips with the churches, which some of the people have already shared, and any other tourist sites in Ontario and beyond. The family gatherings were always enjoyable. When Canadian Tire decided to close the plant where Dad worked, one of the foremen at the plant who had moved to another company, Central Precision Limited, offered my dad and two other men who were working there as the last employees kept on before the, just wrapping up things up at the plant, uh, a job at CPL. Dad asked for a week's holidays, but it wasn't granted. Canadian Tire closed on the Friday and these three men started their jobs at CPL the next Monday. As my dad said, I wasn't sorry, I had a job. He worked at CPL for another 11 years until my mom's illness worsened and my dad retired to be able to spend some time with her, more time with her. Dad was a dedicated, loyal worker. Despite the indiscretions and racism he had to endure from some bosses, co-workers, and in public. While working, he was up at five to be at the plant for seven. He picked up at least one co-worker. He was always driving people to work, right, doing the carpool. He finished work at three, but during the snowy winter months, sometimes he wouldn't get home till after eight, especially when he used to pick up my mom at her job before she got her own car. They liked watching their soap operas. The VCR was set to record them, but dad always waited for her to come home before he would watch them. My mom was active in the BMA church as part of the Ladies League, and my dad became more active, actually as a result of my mother. I think my mom was the one that sort of pulled him into it initially when she was part of the Ladies League at the BME church in 460 Shaw. The family attended many church functions, encouraged by my parents, food and fellowship with God. His wife of 40 years of marriage and friendship passed away on February 15th, 2002, as it was a tough time for him and the rest of his family. Some of you may know I'm an enthusiastic golfer, and some of my golfing buddies are here. 
And eventually that led to, no. I introduced the sport to my daughters. And to help keep dad occupied after my mom's passing, I took him to a practice range. He seemed to have a good time. So I got him some lessons. And then after that, eventually it led to quite a few afternoons out on the golf course with dad and Janelle paired against Serena and I. Lowest score wins, loser buys lunch. <laughs> we played several of the par three courses around Markham where I live and occasionally played some full 18 holes at Deer Creek or Westfield. The girls and I remember once as we walked up to our balls, dad commented that the ball closest to the tee box must have been Serena's or Janelle's. They were maybe 6 and 11 at the time. When it was confirmed that, no, that's your ball, Grandpa. And the girls' balls were further down the fairway or in the rough, along with mine. Dad remarked, well, that's just embarrassing. <laughs> and we all had a good laugh as he lined up his next shot with the same 9 iron he'd used off the tee. Because he felt it was the best club to get the ball in the air rather than have it very low close to the ground using a different club. <laughs> Those were good days on the golf course. Dad had played a little cricket when he was a youth. Others have commented that you know, he was a sports fanatic. But yeah, he played a little uh, cricket when he was a youth. He wasn't athletic though he had the dexterity and the coordination and even the physique if not the size. I remember once throwing a football with him on our next neighbor, the Chappelle's, and Kathy's here today, in the crescent in front of our house. Two fathers and their sons throwing the ball around with awkward spirals right out of Norman Rockwell. Dad met Charmaine, Jacqueline Lewis at church. She'd known my mother, and after several years of dating, they were married on Saturday, September 1st, 2007. Charmaine also has a large extended family, so the holiday dinner tradition increased, and time was split between my cousin Claudine's dinners and barbecues and those at dad and Charmaine's or at Charmaine's sister or her mother's. A few times it was simply the two immediate families, Charmaine and dad and their children and grandchildren. Dad was, enjoying his, Dad was enjoying his retirement. He, we joked with him that he needed to keep himself busy and active. And we would always reply that he had plenty to do to fill that day. Besides, he liked watching wrestling, baseball, and golf. And Charmaine was keeping him busy with activities for the church or helping someone who needed something that they were able to provide. In addition to a day job, Charmaine also, also a hard worker secured a night job cleaning first one bank then a couple more. It kept that active and we thought that's good. But when Charmaine's granddaughter Jenea was old enough to go to school, dad would walk her to school and then pick her up and walk her back to the house. I know that was a treat for both of them and the walks went fast with Jenea talking all the way. <laughs> Charmaine and Dad together continued their activities with the church. Dad became one of the members who helped to collect the offerings. And he would say prayer to bless the offering. He was pretty good at saying prayers. One of the ministers commented on that. And giving the family grace before dinners. He just had a way. Didn't really practice it, it just sort of flowed. Dad was a big fan of the Toronto Blue Jays. The World Series championships in 92 and 93 were exciting for him, as it was for the other fans, obviously. And, he, and, and we still talked about hoping for another championship on time too. Dad used to listen to Jerry Howarth and Tom Cheek, the radio announcers, while watching the television with the volume down. And sometimes he'd have his portable radio so that he could hear the game while he was out doing other things. We attended a few games over the years at, at the, what was the Skydome now Rogers Center. This year we bought eight 
tickets for eight of us to see the Jays play the Yankees this summer. Dad won't be there in the seats, but hopefully he'll be there in fit. I know he'll be there in spirit, and hopefully the Blue Jays can give a win for him that day. Lindell and my mom believed in raising their children the right way. Proper manners, respect for your elders, and authority, and discipline. It's how he was raised. That's how everybody back in those days was raised, I think. But we all knew that our parents loved us and were there to protect us as young children. They were there with advice and support when we, and when we became young adults, my dad always encouraged us to do our best as we strive for success. We know he was proud of his children as we went off to university and graduated with our respective degrees in engineering, business, accounting, and fine art. A call or discussion with him always had the question about how things were done, were going. And when I became a manager, a conversation with my dad about some of the challenges was always reassuring. And there was always the reminder to not get too stressed. Work hard, do your best, and everything will be all right. After the grandchildren were born, the love and support only increased, and the kids all loved their grandfather. My daughters and I would hang out with my grandma and, gra with grandma and grandpa almost every Friday night, having takeout dinners and watching TV or movies. And often they were excited to go over grandpa's, go over for, sorry, grandma's fried dumplings. And he can cook, or he could cook, <laughs> right? and grandpa's cornmeal porridge or fried rice made with uh, rice aroni, they called it. And I remember calling both my parents when I first moved out, asking for, how do we cook this again? How do we cook that? And they, either one would tell me. Even as young teenagers, as teenagers and young adults, my daughters loved hanging out and conversing with their grandfather, laughing with him as he retold and or retold them stories of his youth or when his children were younger and got into trouble. Dad and my mom had many trips back to Jamaica to visit family, and Dad and Charmaine made even more, maintaining that link to his home country. Dad was accommodating several other requests over the, the last years. Dad and Charmaine, my brother and I, were excited to support the creation of a road out of the very rocky landscape around the house, from the main road up to the house where my dad grew up. It's not finished yet, but hopefully we'll be able to see it through. You can see the landscape in some of the pictures uh, that are in the video collage. Our home was also a place when family came to visit. As some of the, uh, the people have, have mentioned, uh, they visited and some stayed for a while as we helped them get to wherever they wanted to go. Getting to know our cousins who visited was good. There were more trips to Niagara Falls and the CN Tower and, the, and some of the church trips they were able to get on if the timing was right. And when dad visited his family, they took care of him and Charmaine, particularly my late cousin Paul and my cousins Richard and Allenton. Dad told Serena the story that he dreamt when he was younger that he was on a plane flying somewhere, but he didn't know where or how. But thanks to God, it just happened that Christine wanted to come to Canada and brought us here too. It was like that dream of flying somewhere had come true. I end up in Canada in 1968, he said. I think it was the best decision I ever made. We have family funeral pot in Aurora. That's where my mom's buried. But dad was sneaky. He told my cousins back in Jamaica a few years ago that after his death, he wanted to be buried at the family site in Jointwood, very close to the house beside his mother and father and some of his siblings. We are honored to make that request come true. I like to think it's dad's way of making sure that we keep ties with the family in Jamaica. As my dad's health worsened, members of the family and friends were over to see him a fair bit. And when he went into palliative care, we coordinated with Charmaine, taking turns to stay with him nonstop. He was not alone. <laughs> I 
during one of those visits, I told him that he needn't worry about us. We were going to be all right. I reminded him that his goal of leaving Jamaica, coming to Canada to have new opportunities and a different life for his children and himself was mission accomplished. Then I sang to him in a trembling voice, much like now, holding back tears, the simple words from Bob Marley's song, Three Little Birds. And we also sang it the night he passed away. I'd like for us to sing those words now. Don't worry about a thing, cause every little thing is gonna be all right. Don't worry about a thing. Cause every little thing is gonna be all right. Don't worry about a thing. Cause every little thing is gonna be all right. Don't worry about a thing. Cause every little thing is gonna be all right. Thank you. Hello. I think it's uh, it's after one now. Praise God. I was told that we have to get everything done in two hours, so we are behind hand. Um, so the question is, do you want to tribute or a sermon? Praise God. Um, <clears throat> I am going to do what I am known to do often, as much as possible, put my notes away and talk to you from the heart, right? Praise God. Okay. When <clears throat> I'm the senior pastor at East York Church, Scarborough, and uh, on the day that we visited Linville, um, a few of us were there, and Reverend Hicks came in after. We went there not primarily to give him the final rites, the last rites. But when we looked at him, we knew that he was ready to go home. So we gave him the last rites. And uh, what I want to talk to you about today came from the fact that I, I looked at Linval and I thought, there better be a resurrection. There better be a resurrection. And then the Spirit said, you're a pastor. You know there is a resurrection. Amen. And so I thought today I would talk to you about the certainty of the resurrection. Because if there is no resurrection, all this is meaningless. Amen. If there is no resurrection, then we are born to die and that's the end of it. St. Paul puts it quite cogently, and he said, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus is not risen. 
And if Jesus is not risen, then our faith is in vain. And our preaching is in vain. What does that mean? It means that if there is no resurrection, we die. We waste away into nothingness. It means that we hear dust to dust and ashes to ashes. And that's the end of it. And Paul went on to say, if that be the case, if Christ is not risen, then we Christians, believers, are of all men most miserable. And the reason for that is because if we don't have a life after death, then what keeps us from going out there and enjoy the pleasures of sin? What keeps you or I from riding roughshod over our neighbor's feelings? From back talking them with our bosses so that we can lose our jobs? Why don't we aim for the best that this world can give to us? If there is no resurrection, that's logical. So I'm here to, today to tell you <clears throat> that there is a resurrection. And uh, I'll try to prove it perhaps in 10, 15 minutes by using the blueprint of the Christian church, which is the Bible. Because you see, in the days of Jesus, in the first century, that question was raised not only by non-believers, but by people who were high up in the, uh, in the Jewish organization. They were called Sadducees. And one day they challenged Jesus. They don't believe in a resurrection. And they said, well, Rabbi, or Rabboni, meaning teacher, what would happen if a man had one wife and then he died and that woman married his brother and then he died and then he died again and there were about six, seven of them in the resurrection whose wife would she be? And they smiled contentedly and Jesus said you have a problem. He didn't say that. I'm saying that. He simply said, you see, in the resurrection, there will be neither marriage nor giving, giving in marriage. And so sometimes we who think that we, we know theology and we have all the answers, we do not fully understand the depth of God's love for us. He could have let humanity just die and because of the sin inherited from Adam, just be destroyed. But his love is so great. So he's so magnanimous. The love is so immense. The immensity of his love. He said, I'm going to redeem them. And so he sent a man called Jesus, the God man. God in the form of flesh to die for all of us so that we too can have a chance to rise again from the dead as he did. And why did Jesus die? He died so that we can be reconciled with the Father. So that we can be reconciled with God. That we too can be assured of a resurrection after we die. And if I were to ask you, and it's a rhetorical question, don't answer, but is there anyone here who has any doubts about the resurrection? What would you answer me? You see, because it's not only in the Jewish community. It's not only in those who do not believe in God. It's among us in the church, not the BME church. I have no evidence of that. 
But in all churches, there is someone who is questioning whether it is more profitable to gain the whole world and lose the so-called soul if we are not going to rise from the dead. Why not get it all now? But I want to tell you that God is not man that he can lie, nor the son of man that he can repent. And when he says something, he means it. And Jesus in chapter 14, the text that was read to you, he told his disciples, he was about to die. Judas had just left to betray him. And he told them, my spirit is heavy. He said, I'm, on, I'm going to be with you for only a while. And then I will be gone. But he says, do not be afraid, in verse 2 and 3. He said, in my father's house there are many mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, I would have told you. Because I can't lie. And if I go to prepare a place for you, then I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, Jesus could not have made that promise unless he knew he would be raised from the dead again on the third day, as he had said. And he's called the first fruits of resurrection, and we too are called the first fruits of the resurrection. In Romans 8, verses 22 and 23, the Bible tells you that creation itself is crying out and calling out and waiting for the redemption of those of us who are the first fruits of the resurrection. And you say, what, you, what are you saying, Pastor? Didn't you hear today that salvation is by faith? Yes. So you were saved. But man is a tripartite being. He is spirit. He has a soul. And he lives in a body. God has redeemed the spirit. And in Romans 12 and verse 2, it says that we ought to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The mind is a part of the soul. And if we renew our minds and we are transformed, what happens? The soul, which is your own personality, which is going to live on in eternity, where in eternity... You are going to determine that. Your soul, your mind, your emotion, and your will, your personality, you are going to understand where you are and why you are there. You see, death is not the end. There is life after death. Death has no more terror terror or horror in it, Jesus conquered death. And it says in one of the texts, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Because the sting of death has been removed when Jesus conquered it. And so we are not to be afraid of death. For death has no more terror. As Shakespeare said, there are no terror. There is no terror in your threats. Cassius, I said to death, there is no terror in you, death. And when people are dying, we sometimes have the feeling that they are afraid. Yes, they are afraid if they do not know God. But if they know Christ, hallelujah. It almost brings tears to my eyes to say this. If they know Christ, they are at peace with the world. Brother Foskin was at peace when I saw him. It seems, as we say, he has been traveling. He had shut out the world, and I believe he was in communication with Jesus himself. The Bible says he will give us that peace, which passes all understanding, which means, I believe, the peace that's so great that our human mind cannot comprehend it. And the joy unspeakable and full of glory. 
That is the consequence of faith and trust in Jesus Christ. There is no terror in death anymore. Death, when we fear death, it's nonsensical if you know Jesus. What is, is the fear of death that causes us to fear death? But if you believe, my friends, we can see that only as a portal, only as a gateway, only as a mechanism to transfer us from the world of now, this world. Mm. This physical realm, that will transfer you there. And if you're a child of God, it would be like a wave of wind wafting you on the seashore, under the coconut trees probably. That will take you through that portal into another reality called eternity. And the question is, my friend, where will you spend eternity? I know where our friend is. Because when I talk about I gave a little tribute to him yesterday. I said he was a Christian, a good man. Yes, he was. And he was saved, yes. Many of us are saved. But we are waiting for Jesus to come back saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah. But God wants us to be like the good Samaritan. To go out in his vineyard and work. And that was Linval. I told you of what I saw, so I would not repeat it now. I will only say that he had the spirit of James, the apostle. Again, I say that. Because James was a man who said, show me your faith. You can tell me how much faith you have. But I'm going to show you my faith by how I treat others. I'm going to show you my faith by the works that I do. And there is a difference between mere salvation which gets you through to heaven and the person who is a good Samaritan all his life, who is saved like you are saved, but who is going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. And that is what this body Linville, the person who occupied this body, will hear. He was a soldier of the cross, not just someone just limping around. As I said one time, in the basement of God's, in the spiritual basement of God, waiting for Christ to come back. How long, Lord, will you wait? I'm ready to come home. But nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. You're a young man. You're a young lady. Work in the vineyard of God. And then you will be certain to see your loved one. You will be certain to see Linval. The question is not whether Linval there's a resurrection for him. I can say yes. He will rise, but will you see him again? That's the question that you yourself has, have to answer. For it is appointed unto man once to die, and after death the judgment. I talked about Paul, I talked about everything in here. But I'm not going to talk about them anymore. I'll just end by saying this. Jesus said in the first text that we read, when he said, if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. I think it's Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? I love Thomas, he questioned things. And Jesus said, I am the way. 
the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except he comes to me. Sorry, Buddha. You should read, the people should read this verse. And I have great Muslim friends. I live beside a few of them. But Muhammad could never say that because he's still dead. Our Lord is alive. Amen? Our Lord is alive. Krishna is dead. Buddha is dead. Muhammad is dead. But Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, so shall you be if you walk in his ways and keep his commandments. May God bless you. At this time, I would like to recognize any ministers of the clergy here with us today. I would like them to stand or indicate by the raising of the hand. Thank you, thank you. At this point, I will ask the family of the deceased to make the way so they can lay the hand for the last moment so that we can have that last closure. So we'll ask the family to make their way to the casket. Touch the casket. beautiful sight. Let us pray. O oh, loving God, we come before you at this moment, O oh God, on the behalf of this family. Lord, we come knowing that Mary and Martha seek you in time of their great need. And so, Father, you make your way, and you were able, O oh God, to share tears with them. And today, O oh Heavenly Father, as a family mourned and grieved the loss of loved one, you know, O oh God, because you have been beside the graveside of Lazarus. And so today, Lord, we ask on the behalf that you will comfort them as you have comforted Martha and Mary, O oh God, and the last of their brother. And so today, O oh God, we stand with our brother, our sisters, Lord, as a mourn the last of the loved one. But Lord, we ask you for comfort. Lord, we ask you for strength. Lord, we ask you for wisdom that they will able to deal with the pain, the sorrow, the grief that you have known. So Lord, we thank you and we give you praise. And we give you all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. At this time we will have the, the metal. Eternal God, who have made us all, and here's nothing that you have made. And you have given your son for remembrance. We commend our brother, but I live but a Linval Augustine Foskin into your perfect mercy and wisdom. Eternal rest grant unto him and let perpetual light shine upon him. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen and amen. Amen. As the family make the way back to the seat, we will have our closing hymn. And after the closing hymn, we will have our closing prayer and benediction by Reverend Alston Mockery. Well, it is. 
soul. Praise the Lord. Before I say the closing prayer, I just want to say something. And um, it has to do with my brother, Linval Augustus Foskin. You notice I didn't say Foskin. And the reason for that is, when I first met him, he said his name was Linval Foskin. But people call him Foskin. And whenever I talk to him, he, I call him Foskin. So he's, he, he, he liked when I talked to him because I was the only person who was calling him by his real name, Foskin. <laughs> but anyway, I met him when I joined the East York. And um, I was always sitting at the back of the church. And one day he came and said, okay, come on, come and sit with us. And I, he was sitting in the middle of the, the church. So I moved from the back and went to the middle of the church to sit with him. And uh, his wife died, his first wife died. And then he married the second wife. But there was something that happened when he married the second wife. Because when, when they came to church, I was always sitting between them. <laughs> and then at the day of the wedding, one guy came and came to him and said, "Are you the one she's going? She, you, she's going to marry? I thought it, I thought it was that guy you, she was going to marry." <laughs> but so I said, oh, "No, I'm already married." So I came. <laughs> And um, from that time, we became so close, like we were brothers. He was like an older brother to me. And when I lost my sight, most of my sight, he was always there to help me. But the Faskin and Sister Faskin gave me a right to church when I couldn't get a right. They always um, gave me help. So when I heard that um, song tonight, then my living would not be in vain. I can say to the Foskins, Sister Foskin and the, the the other Faskins, his sons and daughters and grandchildren, that his life was not in vain. Because if he had helped one person, just look up on the stage and he is talking to you. May God bless him and may his soul rest. In peace. Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you this day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for all you have done for us, O oh, Father. And we thank you for the life, O oh, Father, of Linville Augustus. Paskin. He has lived life. He came, O oh Father. He walked in your vineyard. And his work is now ended, and you have called him home. May, O oh Father, 
his soul rest in eternal peace. And may his family, Father, his wife, children, and grandchildren continue, Father, where he left off so that the, his living would not be in vain. And that, O oh, Father, that you are the God of all, of us all, and you can help us whenever we call upon you. And for all the ministers, leaders, congregation, and for the family and friends of Brother Faskin, we pray you may continue to bless them and continue to guide them, guard them, and protect them. And may, when we have left this place, we know that we are in your hands and you will continue to provide for us. For you said you would never leave us nor forsake us. You would always be your friend. We pray, O oh God, that you will do this for us. For we are thy children. These and other mercies we ask of you, Lord. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen, amen. and amen. At this time, we will ask the funeral director to make a way, after which we will allow the family to exit. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank you for the privilege of having us here with you today to celebrate Linville's celebration of life. We will be leaving the church, and as you are aware, there is not a burial to follow as he'll be making his way back to the funeral home, preparations to continue his way home to Jamaica. There are light refreshments in the lower level if you're able to stay, and what we're going to be doing momentarily is having Linville lead us from the church and then we'll pause for just a moment and if the pallbearers would like to step in and follow in behind and then we'll guide family through as well. And just a reminder if there's anyone parked in the side or double parked, if you would like to maybe mobile your vehicles so some people can leave if they're not able to stay in the lower level with us. And again, thank you for today.
I die. Oh, in a by and by, I fly away. I will go to I fly away. Good to have you. Welcome, my brother. Young fellow, God bless you. Good to have you. Hey, my man, God be with you. We look at you. I doing much better, man. God bless you. I forget. Hey, how? I picking up, man. I picking up. Good to see you. I, I was glad when I see you. Hey, my boy. <laughs> 